Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello, and welcome to the Safer Sim webinar series. My name is Jacob Hyden, and I am a research coordinator for the Safer Sim UTC. Today's webinar is effectiveness of in vehicle virtual traffic control devices. Um, and this will be presented by David Noyce and Madhav Chitari of University of Wisconsin Madison. I will let them take it over from here. Thank you, Jacob. So David Noyce here. Thank you to all my colleagues and friends out there for joining us here for what should be a little bit less than an hour, depending upon how much discussion you'd like to have at the end, pertaining to a small research project that we did as part of the Safer Sim research program here through the Traffic Operations and Safety Lab in the College of Engineering at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. So let's go ahead and jump in and we'll watch the, uh, the question bar here on the side. So if you want to stop me or you have a question along the way, please feel free to do so and we'll try to, uh, to catch it as we go. So hang on one second, my slide is not advancing. <clears throat> there we go. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about the motivation, how we got the thoughts uh, of uh, putting together a research project like we're gonna talk about. The, this photograph I'm sure many of you have seen on the internet, it's been floating around for almost 20 years. And it's an extreme example of some of the things that we've been talking about in the traffic control device world for many years. And that, that involves you know, the simple concept of visual clutter and how we expect drivers to search for information and the difficulty that goes along with that with searching for visual information that's of importance in very cluttered situations like this one. So, so this is the extreme example where there's a, a hidden speed limit sign in the middle of all these other business signs that, that make it quite challenging for drivers to see this type of information. So the question that we've been pondering for, for many, many years is how do we come up with a system that provides drivers only with the information they need and then eliminates the information that they don't need? So optimizing the, the visual information presented to drivers as he or she travels along the roadway. Well, the opposite end of the spectrum is this roadway that exists with no traffic control at all. And what would that look like? And perhaps we're heading in that direction at some point in time as we move into this world of autonomous transportation. But we have a long time in between where we have this transition going on, and that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about here today. So what else motivated us to, to think along this topic? So what I wanna do is just take a couple of minutes to take a step backwards and tell you briefly about a project we completed recently that was focused on the development and evaluation of elongated pavement marking signs. And I know we're not here to talk about this topic, so I'll try and keep this real brief. But nevertheless, I think it's important to help set the foundation of what it is that we want to talk about. So as you can see on the screen, hopefully, the objective of this previous research was to look at how effective elongated pavement marking signs were as painted with either paint or epoxy or some form of of material on the roadway system and communicating with drivers and perhaps leading to better performance or at least optimal performance of what we're hoping drivers will do under various types of conditions. And what was unique about this research is moving away from what's been done for some time with guide-based information and looking at the impact of regulatory and warning signs used in this elongated pavement marking environment. So as you can see in the, the, the photos on this screen, there was a number of random examples, none of them so-called sanctioned by the MUTCD, but people who had experimented, traffic engineers who experimented with different types of pavement marking to help better communicate some of these important pieces of information that drivers need. Now, what we knew or, and what we needed to explore as part of this research was, if we're gonna use these type of signs, how best to apply them. So that's where the, the research on the elongation came in on how much should these be elongated to best allow drivers to see them from some distance upstream. So the first part of this research looked at all these different signs types, and we actually boiled it down to really three. 
in two types of warning signs, the, the curve and the pedestrian one that you see, as well as the speed limit sign. And we wanted to explore the different types of elongations that went along with that. So we looked at elongations from, from one to one or no elongation all the way up to 10 to one. And long story short, what we found was as elongation increased, driver's ability to see the, the information further upstream increased as well. But there were some limits to what we could do, and the elongation of five to one seemed to be the one that worked best for us. And for those of you who have seen or are familiar with MUTCD, that's somewhat larger than what currently is being used in the, the 1.2 to 1.25 elongation ratios now with other types of traffic control devices. So what we also want to do then is say, well, let's look at these signs and in parallel with the traditional post-mounted signs that exist along the roadway. So what states wanted to do was say, well, let's look at putting this on the pavement and then putting it next to the post-mounted sign and seeing how effective that may be in better communicating with drivers. So we experimented, that with, a, was experimented with that for a bit using both our driving simulator and some field applications that I'll go through real quickly. So we looked at a number of simulator examples, and here are some screenshots from that. They looked at the various devices, and we also applied them in the field. <clears throat> and when we applied them in the field, we, we used the 1.5 elongation ratio with various speed limit signs. You'll see some sites that we use in, in Kansas and Missouri and Wisconsin. And we also looked at the curve warning and pedestrian signs here again in Kansas and Wisconsin. Photographs here that uh, looked at again in parallel with the post mounted signs that you see on both sides of the roadway there. And what we concluded from this research was that these elongated signs were actually quite effective in better communicating the information that we wanted drivers to, to absorb as they entered some of these curves and other locations that additional warning was required. What we also saw is that these signs when placed on the roadway, so these elongated painted pavement marking signs were, were effective at better controlling speeds and also better at sharing information such that the performance of drivers was more in line with what we expected at these various locations. So what this led us to think about is how we could best replicate this information in the driving environment with all types of traffic control information that drivers need. So in other words, well, what the elongated pavement markings really did was put a in your nose, so to speak, traffic control device that would be very similar to a heads up display type device to communicate with you and to give you the important information that you need regardless of the type of traffic control situation you were entering. So with that in mind and with that background, what we wanted to do was to explore how effective traffic control devices, specifically regulatory and warning signs would be in this augmented reality type technology or heads up display type technology in a vehicle. So to do that, providing the display wasn't overly difficult, but we wanted to see how drivers would react under different types of scenarios and how they would behave based on the information that was being presented. And then we also want to look at several possibilities of perhaps even replacing post-mounted signs to see what would a world look like if you think back to that, that uh, no sign roadway I showed you at the beginning of this presentation. You know, what would that world look like if indeed there was no signs, but the only information that was important to the driver was presented to them through a heads up display. So that was the primary objective of where we wanted to go with this research. Now, there's been a number of similar type applications that have looked at this, this, this type of problem. I won't spend a lot of time elaborating on each one of them, but some of you may be familiar and some of you may actually have been involved in some of this research that looked at different types of augmented reality to, to help different cohorts of drivers. So this first one I have here looked at how to better communicate and prove elderly driver hazard um, perception of different scenarios along the roadway. And we, we put a couple of screenshots here from, from this research just to kind of set the stage. But this particular screenshot looked at a, excuse me, a deer and animal crossing situation that existed and seeing what could do or what the, the researcher augmented reality could do 
to better communicate that information with drivers. In a, in a nutshell, what was found was that augmented reality was actually pretty good and it helped improve the information that was being presented and augmented reality cues in general is effective at improving, in this case, elderly drivers, but perhaps all drivers in better detection and likelihood of what may be happening as they, they approach or move downstream along the roadway. Similarly, another research study that's similar to the idea that we had was looking at how augmented reality may impact, again, older drivers, but this time with gap estimation for left turns. Again, a driving simulator-based research project. And as you can see here in this um, photograph at the bottom of the slide, you can see how you can animate a situation and put a heads-up type piece of information to help share with drivers that in this particular scenario that left turns were not desirable and or some information related to gaps was not acceptable. Therefore, we could better communicate that with drivers through some form of a augmented reality or what I keep referring to as a heads-up display type piece of information in, in the vehicle. <clears throat> and of course, as you probably expected, the results suggested that, well, this is not such a bad idea, that the, these cues are effective in motivating driver responses without any adverse safety violations. And therefore, you know, some form of communication with drivers like this could be very effective at improving the safety of different types of situations in this particular case, permissive left turns. So thinking about all the things that I presented to you thus far, what we also then, and what I'm sure all of you know, is that the world of vehicles is changing rapidly. And most of at least the higher end vehicles now have some form of a in-vehicle or heads-up display type um, device already installed. We're now at a point where we don't even need to think about, you know, an off-the-shelf or, or a secondary type product in the vehicle in order to add information in a heads-up display format. There, there's many of them out there now that I won't go into, but Apple, CarPlay, Android Auto, there, there's several that provide different types of heads-up display information. Most of them are focused on some, sort of, some form of operating speed in addition to the posted speed limit and guidance information, you know, similar to a GPS type guidance display. A recent, oops, a recent visit that we all made at Safer Sim to, to, to NADS at, at the University of Iowa got us all excited about a demo vehicle that they have that, that's a, a Volvo a CS90 or CR90 or so, some sort of high-end vehicle, but it has all the bells and whistles. Um, if you're looking for a new car, I highly recommend it because it's really a nice looking vehicle. But in lieu of selling vehicles at this moment in time, what I will tell you is that there's lots of interesting technology that, that exists on this vehicle that also provides information that can help us with this type of research. Well, there's certainly the adaptive cruise control and the, the video surround, I should say the, the driver camera surround, um, various types of alerts, blind spot alerts, lane keeping. But there's also some information and some important information available related to not only detecting objects, but also providing a heads-up display type scenario in this vehicle. So th there's a lot of nice technology out there in some of these upper-end vehicles that can help us as we move along. But now let's get back to the details of the research. So what we wanted to do is, using our driving simulator-based environment, let's look at how we might be able to apply augmented reality to explore regulatory and warning traffic control devices and see how drivers would react to these types of situations. So because we were limited to the number of different scenarios we could look at, we, we did boil it down to similar devices that we looked at with the elongated pavement marking project that I talked to you about before. And that is a uh, curb warning and pedestrian warning and speed limit signs. But we also experimented with some other devices that I'll share with you in just a, a bit here, and that's related to Chevron. So you see Chevron's on this slide here down at the bottom. But Chevron's used not in the traditional way, and you'll see we used it as, a, as an enhanced head-up display on horizontal curves to use it as 
almost a guidance type piece of information for drivers to see how they would react under those types of situations. So we at the University of Wisconsin, like I know some of you online here as I check the names have, you know, very similar um, RTI type driving simulator. I have a little video here that I'll play while I'm talking about it. So we used our driving simulator here at the University of Wisconsin. That is the, the RTI Ford Fusion body type format. I'm not sure if uh, you can hear the, the wonderful background music I have on my slide here, but but uh, but nevertheless, uh, we can hear it here on our end. So ho hopefully that's not distracting anybody. But a uh, very traditional driving simulator. Um, we have the the five five projectors forward, one rear. We have the the side projection, etc. So it provides us a very very fun and useful device to explore different types of problems like we're talking about here today. Um, our simulator has one degree of motion, so there is a front and back type movement that you see here a little bit. And I'm going to skip forward on this because I think most of you have seen simulators, so we don't need to expend a lot of time looking at all these different types of details. So we, we took the simulator environment, and what we did was develop a visual world that looked at three geometrically identical scenarios using a very traditional roadway cross-section. And what we wanted to do is put drivers in a random sense, both in starting position and in scenario that they observe, and explore how they operated under conditions where under scenario A was a scenario where there was just no signage whatsoever. How would drivers operate under these conditions? And then compare that to a scenario, which we call scenario B, that was very traditional MUTCD compliant signage for the various types of um, traffic control information that we had in there. And then a scenario C where the information was presented in an augmented reality type format. And by comparing and exploring how drivers um, operated in each one of these scenarios would give us, at least in terms of our, our hypothesis, some idea how effective this augmented reality signage might be. So again, all three of these were presented in a geometrically identical scenario. Now, to, to make it more visually easy to see here, we, we boiled it down to, to this linear-based diagram, even though there was a looping environment here in the simulator. And what you can see is that we had, again, random starting points, but we had a number of geometric features that allowed for curve information, pedestrian information, curve information, and then at the end there, were, there was a stop control information. That, uh, that drivers could, could observe and, and we could evaluate their behavior and operating conditions under each one of those control locations. So uh, we'll show you a video here in just a minute, but as a, a quick screen snapshot, what you see is a, a signless type environment. You see the more traditional MBTCD postponed and sign environment. And then, you know, this photograph doesn't do do a complete justice, but the heads up display, we, we experimented by using the, the information actually built into the visual world versus the, the, the true um, windshield based heads up display environment. And it made it just a little bit cleaner from an experimental standpoint, but the, 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 the general view that the driver, the driver saw was identical but allowed us to do a number of more experimental based things and look at some different ideas here as we did this research. So again, we looked at a number of different scenarios and different signs. So this is with the pedestrian crossing. You can see the, the no sign pedestrian sign and, and then the augmented reality sign and et cetera, et cetera, for each one of the, the scenarios. Now, what you see and what we did here was a number of additional things that I think is important to point out. We have some dynamic elements to the sign pre presentation that I'll show you by video here in a second. So the, the, the signs were displayed dynamically in the form of an augmented reality using, I guess, an overlay function. Maybe that's more information that we really need to talk about here. But as I showed you in the photograph before, it was a way to make it, frankly, a little bit easier to operate within the driving simulator environment. We did look at some sign flashing related 
scenarios and part of the sign flashing was to to explore the visual detection of drivers and help them as time went on and they became more use of a visual display type environment or heads up display environment we wanted to make sure there, there, there was some uh, attention grabbing characteristics that, that would be presented or at least experimented with under these different types of conditions so we, we did look at some sign flashing in the driver's line of sight and with a built-in time function in the simulator and the, the location of those signs are about five inches above the hood so so just below but very near the line the driver's typical line of sight now what we also had to do kind of supplemental in a supplemental way to this research was to look at flash rates that was most effective now there, there isn't a whole lot of science behind this so we did it somewhat subjectively but what we did believe and what we did observe was the traditional MUTCD flash rate might have been a little bit too slow in order to have a true true capture rate. So we, we looked at some different flash rates, but we settled in on about a, a quarter of a second flash rate or, or an on and off about twice, twice per second. Um, that also helped us with some of the perception reaction time decisions that we made, and, and we'll show that in some of the data coming up here. Um, I also mentioned that we looked at some flashing rates of chevrons, and I'll show you that in just a second here. But we also thought maybe there's some benefit of, in this augmented and heads-up display environment to have a, a another form of, of positive guidance, if you will, through horizontal curves and see how that improved drivers in terms of lane position and control through especially sharper horizontal curves that have some history of run-off-the-road type of crashes. So here is a video capture, the best we were able to get it here, of some of the different pieces of information. So you saw a speed limit sign that came up there just a second ago. And you can see a very hard to detect, you a little bit cleaner in the simulator, but you see the, the flash of the signs and you also see some of the positive guidance arrows that were presented on the roadway. And again, we're looking at the augmented augmented scenario here so this is the heads-up display that's it so here's the curve information here's some of the augmented um, chevrons that are being presented to the driver as they go through the curve again speed limit information so we we can debate the the, the value of the flash here at the end if you like but we thought it provided a little bit stronger attention grabbing at least in terms of experimentation maybe it's something we need to explore a little bit further as we go down the road here but nevertheless it provides some interesting information and in, and in, in a, a supplemental follow-up with drivers who participated in this research seemed to be something that was indeed an attention grabber for them as they process all the other information that was being presented so let me tell you a bit about the, the, the study details now in general, and we'll get to the results here real quick. As all of you know who are involved in this type of research, we went through the typical protocol of involving our institutional review board since we're working with subjects and preparing all the, the necessary information for sharing with, with subjects when they came in and agreed to participate in this research, including all the possible health risks that go along with it, et cetera. This was a small subject study to help us get going or help at least look at the, uh, the things that we've been talking about. So at the end of the day, we had 20 subjects that participated, 11 males and, and nine females. Age range was from 20 to 68 and uh, various ranges of driver experience from you know, four to uh, up to 52 years of driving experience for our 68 year old subject. Again, each subject was asked to drive through the three different scenarios and we randomized these the best we could to make sure we didn't have any learning effects or other adverse impacts to our results. <clears throat> Supplementally, what I'm showing you here on this screen is we also set up some what we call data analysis zones. And I'm showing you here in a static way the different zones that we created. But they paralleled the sign placements that were there. It allowed us to, to better break out subsections of the data from the driving simulator, specifically the path trace type data, to see how speed, pedestrians, curve information, behavior, 
all those types of things were being presented by drivers and and how they were impacting some of the information that we were looking for. As you know, if you are involved in driving simulator research, for, for any of this type of, of study, you can get oodles and oodles of data. So we want to also minimize the, the large sets of data that we were going to David, I think we lost you. Uh, the microphone is not coming through anymore. Okay. All right. I think we are having some slight technical difficulties here. If everyone just wants to hang on for a couple minutes, we'll get this sorted out here shortly. Thank you. Are we back? Jacob, you hear me okay? We're back in action. Hey, David, you are good to go. I'm a, so I'm that's, yes, apologize. Don't know what hiccup there happened, but uh, must have been something on my end. So I apologize for that. Nope. Yeah. So I well, lost my point here, but I think we were talking about data collection and, and I was explaining the analysis zones and then some of the things that we also collected in terms of speed profile, some trajectory information, and some other things that I'll tell you about here in just a second. All right, so I'm still having some technical difficulties. One second, please. There we go. Um, now, what I won't spend a lot of time here, but all of you know that are involved in research, at the end of the day, we have to evaluate our data. So we went through the traditional set of statistical based analyses in this particular case was an overly difficult because the data was relatively simple. But we looked at um, a number of different tests at the end that were non parametric in, in nature because of the, uh, the different or the nature of this data and the different types of things we wanted to look at. But really what we wanted to focus on was looking at the average speeds at critical points along the driveway and see how drivers behaved and reacted to different types of conditions. So let's jump into the findings now. So first of all, here are some results when we average speeds among the subject at different locations. So the first two you see here are speed limit based locations and the, the last one is at a pedestrian crossing. And I'm going to ask you to do what you never ask somebody to do when you put up a bunch of numbers on the slide is to I'm going to ask you to kind of ignore the details of all these numbers. We'll look at it in a more general sense. That's what I'm going to ask you to think about. So what I mean by that is recall that scenario A was the scenario with no signage. Scenario B was the MUTCD based signage and then C augmented. And as a first snapshot, what we were interested in here was how drivers operated within these scenarios when there was no signage. So you're operating in the so-called free flow type environment and driving at a level of comfort versus when we had some traffic control in place to help guide them. And as you can see across the board under scenario A, drivers tended to go a little bit quicker through, through the scenario than when there was some traffic control in place. And I think this is probably similar to what you'd find on an open roadway if you do a similar type of experiment. Now we have to be a little bit careful with that because those of you online here who use driving simulators know that uh, you know, experimenters or drivers, when they get in this scenario, tend, tend to have a lead foot type of experience. So they like to go a little bit quicker than perhaps we, we want them to. So, so a little of this, little of this could be simply be, um, based on drivers operating conditions within the driving simulator. But we did randomize the scenarios and the presentation, et cetera. So we feel pretty good about the results saying that, uh, you know, it's driving without signs results in a little bit of higher operating speed. When you look at scenario B and C, what we saw was very consistent speed results 
with the METCD type signage and with a heads up display type signage. So this gave us our first insight into thinking, well, this augmented display type approach may be as effective or, or at least as a possible supplement to post mounted signs when you have this technology in these types of environments. So we, we did a lot of slicing and dicing of speeds that I didn't put all those slides in to, to share with you here today. But what this slide simply says is what I just told you on the previous, that operating speeds were higher without signs than they were with signs. Um, METCD and augmented reality were very similar. And what we also saw was speed deviations with the signage tended to be less than speed deviations when there was no signage in place. So this is probably logical to a lot of you who are involved in this type of research, but I think it was important to kind of set the foundation for what we were doing. What we also did was look at each one of these critical points. So I told you about all these analysis zones that we've identified. And we're not going to go through each and every one here, but here's a couple of snapshots of what we found and what they look like. So here's an approach to, to the first curve that was in our overall visual world. And what we're showing here simply is that when we look at average speeds, the blue line there being the no signage scenario, the green and red line being the METCD, and then the what we call the holographic style, the heads-up display or augmented reality type, type signage. And you see the, the consistency in the red and the green are the bottom two lines in the greater variability of the, uh, the the no signage scenario. But nevertheless, when we got into the curve, the, the speeds were relatively consistent. So you see the greater variability in speed or operating speed conditions in the um, no signage scenario. <clears throat> and, and this is pretty consistent as you go through. So this is kind of just flipping the table here and looking at how speeds did vary in, in nature, and in this particular case, the, the more variability would show up at the bottom of the curve. In other words, the blue is at the bottom of this diagram, which would expect. So there's much less variability when the signage was in place. Again, without going through every one, what we also did was look at path trace of vehicles. And it's relatively easy to do when you only have 20 subjects. But we looked at path trace through the various speed data collection locations that I mentioned to you before. And here's an example of what it would look like. So we have speed profiles here of all the all 20 subjects, you know, based on distance or travel that we identified in each one of these analysis zones, and then speed being on the y-axis of this diagram. So I'm showing you this more for an example here, but let me go ahead and move forward to putting them side by side, which was one of the important things we wanted to look at. So here's one of the scenarios we looked at with no signage, this was at our curve number five in the data analysis, um, a scenario with the METCD, and a scenario with the augmented reality. And if you can kind of put them side by side here, <clears throat> what you see is that the overall operating speeds as we identified in scenario A, or the no signage scenario was a little bit higher, you see the consistency in B and C, but there still was some randomness in terms of you see the spikes in several of the drivers that, that did a number of interesting things at locations. But at the end of the day, we tried to bring some of this information together into one speed profile and look at how average averages went through each one of these, these locations. The beauty of the driving simulator allows you to look at this type of information in detail. So we look at speed profiles. We can look at lane placement. We can do a lot of different things as drivers went through these different locations. I'm not going to talk a lot about this here, but what I also wanted to just briefly mention to you is we were also able to use our eye tracking system and look at how drivers scan for information. And I do not have all that data summarized for you in the presentation today. That's something that we're still looking at as part of this research. But what we see here and what you might expect is we can explore how drivers search for information, which can also supplement our understanding of how drivers use the three different scenarios that we had in place here and search for the information they felt was critical as they approached the curves, as they went into the straightaway, as they had scenarios with no signage, what did they do, um, et cetera, and, and, and uh, on, you know, so forth on down the line here. 
So that information, I think, is quite powerful. Again, I don't have it all synthesized for you, but you can see in the typical heat maps that are used for this type of information that we're able to identify, you know, the amount of time and where the primary search locations were, you know, based on, you know, the dashboard or inside the vehicle and then within the roadway on the sides, the signs themselves, et cetera. So I think this is going to be very important as we move forward here. So let me bring this all to, to a close here, and then you can ask any questions or explore anything that you would like to talk about here to wrap this seminar up. But I think you can tell based on how I presented the last few slides is that we were able to identify how drivers operate and behave under these different types of signage scenarios that we presented. And what we found was, and again, totally understand this is a small sample driving simulator based research project that we have not put out in the field yet. But I think there's enough information for us to, to believe that the augmented reality signs or that are presenting this information in a heads up display type environment has some promise. And it's certainly doable within the regulatory and warning sign family to share the appropriate information with drivers. So the augmented reality or the heads up display is a possible substitute as we move forward in the world of vehicle to infrastructure type technology and ultimately into the connected and fully autonomous environment of sharing information with drivers in this type of format and then getting to the world that I think we all would agree we want to get to of minimizing the amount of so-called sign pollution or traffic control device pollution like we saw at the very beginning in that slide and getting to the point to where we can optimize the traffic control device information presented to drivers and only present the information to drivers that they need given the scenarios that they're experiencing. When we can get to that point, obviously that not only would be extremely cost effective, but safety and operational conditions will clearly improve under those type of environments. So, so that is what we prepared for you here today. And I'm going to pass back to, to Jacob now and, and have you facilitate any questions or comments that people have based on what we talked about. Excellent presentation, David. Um, it looks like we have a question here from Texas A&M Transportation Institute. Um, and they would like you to talk more about the rationale behind your decision to flash the AR signs rather than just have a static transparent overlay. Yeah, so, so the rationale was very simple. And as, as I mentioned, now we, we did do some beta testing of the different scenarios that you saw in, in a non-flash type of environment. And that's certainly a feasible solution and maybe ultimately as effective as what we saw here. We did not go or do a side-by-side -side test of the two. But as I believe I mentioned during the presentation here, the, the primary objective of that was to provide more of an attention-grabbing type display. In other words, you know, in the world of, if you go back to what you saw in the photograph that I presented with the heads-up display environments and some of the vehicles that exist, there, there's a fair amount of information that's presented there in parallel and simultaneously with any traffic control device stuff that would exist. So the GPS route information or GPS route information, um, there's some speed, you're posted and your operating speed, et cetera. So what we thought this may be a better way to at least initially grab the attention of the driver when these warning signs or the appropriate information needed to be presented to the drivers primarily as they entered horizontal curves. Now our scenarios were limited and I didn't talk much about the pedestrian crossing scenarios that existed and we looked at. But if you think about the horizontal curve scenario, we thought this might be a better way to, to grab the driver's attention on the approach to the horizontal curve that indeed there was a horizontal curve and a speed warning um, advisory speed type situation that existed there. So hopefully that explains why we did it. You know, we can debate whether it was a good idea or a bad idea. And again, we didn't do a side by side comparison of the static sign, but allow us to see how effective that was from a driver attention grabbing standpoint. I have a question, David. Oh, here, 
Te Texas A&M just responded, the eye gaze heat map suggested to me that you may have had some cognitive capture toward the display area. How could you measure those effects, those effects in future studies? That, that's a great question. Um, we're looking at that now and trying to see what we can learn from how drivers search for that information and where they presented or focused their information or attention grabbing eyesight, if you will, on the different things that we had presented to them. There's some challenges with that, as, as I'm sure the questioner knows, in that you know, there, there's some variability in determining where the drivers are actually looking and because of the way that we presented the information here using the visual world in the simulator, that, that we, we can't always say for sure exactly what was being looked at, especially in the central realm of the visual world there. So I don't have a great answer for you right now, but it's something that we're looking at and seeing what we can do to, uh, to at least process information we have and just as a, a point of information here, we are looking at a, a supplement to this research to explore another set of drivers and enhancing some of the things that we found here. And that's one of the things that we're, we want to explore in greater detail. ETI says we can discuss more at TRB. So <laughs> if you. I think I'm talking to Sue, so I'd love to, Sue. <laughs> Um, yeah, David, I had a question. So I recently saw an article online that said, I think Honda patented an, an AR windshield that is supposed to help detect uh, pedestrians on the side of the road. Um, so let's say, imagine you're driving down the city and you have that windshield. And so you have these little, I don't know, whatever, whatever they use to detect the pedestrians, little boxes to show that they might be crossing. And then if you have the right. heads up display showing the speed limit sign too, and then, you know, I'm sure eventually sometime Walmart is going to want to start advertising or something on these heads up dis displays if they get the chance. Um, so how are you going to, I'm just thinking back to that first picture of the clutter on the highway. Do you foresee any challenges with clutter on the windshield? Um, no question. That's a possibility. And, and, you know, we've had this discussion for quite some time with all of the in-vehicle type sources of information that, that currently exist in vehicles and are being talked about, including what we're talking about, to, to give other types of information to drivers. So that's something that we need to explore. And again, rightly or wrongly, part of the basis for why we try to use the, the flashing environment, at least to start this experiment, that there will be, need to be some attention grabbing mechanisms for the most critical information well, but you're right Jacob in terms of when there are simultaneous warnings that are needed you know so as your example of the, this and I've seen that commercial with the the Honda you know block pedestrian type warning device and then in parallel with other warnings whether it be curve or whether it be something else you know how best to present that information to drivers you know that that's where I do need a a Sue Chrysler and a John Lee and some of my other human factors experts to, to work with us on that to see what the best way is to do it. Okay, I guess we will open the chat up for any last questions quick. And it doesn't look like anyone is typing. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending the webinar. Um, a recording of this webinar will be posted to the Safer Sim YouTube channel, and it will also be posted online on our website and basically all of our social media too. So wherever you find us, you'll be able to find this webinar. Do you have anything else you want to add, David? Nope. Happy holidays, everybody, and we'll see you all at TRB. All right. Thank you. Goodbye.